Hello everyone and welcome to our How to Thrive Despite Chronic Pain webinar. Uh, we're glad to have you with us here today. My name is Tanya Hyde and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm the project manager with the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability and this webinar is made possible through the support of the Community Gaming Grant Program through the BC government as well as donations and memberships to our organization CIRPD. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Tanya, and I'll be moderating the webinar uh, and handling the Q&A session today. And our presenter is Dr. Afton Hassett. Dr. Hassett is a licensed clinical psychologist and an associate research scientist in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan Medical School. As a principal investigator at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, she conducts highly collaborative research related to exploring the role of cognitive, affective, and behavioral factors in chronic pain populations. Her most exciting and innovative positive health research involves the evaluation of resilience factors in sparing premature cellular aging in patients with chronic pain as well as developing prehabilitation programs for surgical patients before surgery to optimize outcomes. We're very glad to have you today with us. Afton, I will hand it over to you. Well, hello. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate the introduction, and, and thank you for the rest of you for being on the line today. I, I look forward to hearing from you in the question and answer session. But I think I'll take the first uh, probably 40 to 45 minutes of our time together and just give you an overview about some of the research out there that helps inform us how it is that patients can thrive despite living with chronic pain. Okay, let me see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So I'd like to begin with a case. Um, this is a case of a 44-year-old Caucasian man who presented to a physician with severe chronic low back pain that began in college that was seemingly due to a football injury he sustained. He has undergone multiple back surgeries, none of them resulting in adequate pain relief. The most recent surgery was complicated by sepsis, which nearly resulted in the patient's death. He is currently prescribed multiple analgesics, yet the pain persists. In addition, he's under the care of an orthopedist, a urologist, an ontolaryngologist, an endocrinologist, and he carries the additional diagnoses of irritable bowel syndrome that began for him in childhood. And in adulthood, he has experienced chronic prostatitis, headache, myofascial pain, reactive depression, and insomnia. His gastrointestinal symptoms at times are so severe that he is totally incapacitated. Yet, these are all second to the back pain that he experiences that plagues him daily. So when we as care providers see a case like this, we often clutch our hearts and think, oh, what are we going to do to help such a person? Is there any future for somebody with a history that looks like this? And then I'd like to tell you the identity of this patient. The patient is John F. Kennedy, certainly a resilient individual and one who was able to achieve great things as a 35th president of the United States. So um, Mr. Kennedy's uh, history was researched by uh, myself and my colleague Robert Pinels, who is a rheumatologist who was able to go to the uh, JFK uh, Library Archives and unearth all the medical records. And we were able to put together this, um, this comprehensive case that really focused on the painful, or the chronic pain aspects of his life. So I looked to him for inspiration. In our talk, we're going to cover four topics. Um, the first is I'll talk a little bit about the nature of pain. I think if the more we understand about how slippery and fascinating pain is, the more we can understand how patients may be able to thrive despite their pain. The second session is we'll talk about the role of emotions in pain and how powerful our emotions are in our experience of pain. Next, we'll look at people with chronic pain who are very, very different. All patients are not the same. And then lastly, we'll look at how positive emotions and resilience can be engendered in our patients, in ourselves, and, um, and if you are a patient, how you can do this to help yourself and hopefully have a more, um, a better quality of life. So we begin with the nature of pain. This is actually diffuse spectrum imaging, that beautiful rainbow of connectivity within the brain. 
So I say that when we, if we understand the nature of pain, it really will help us better understand the relationship between resilience and pain. So early, as early as the 1600s, is probably our most comprehensive theory of pain that stated that pain is a stimulus response. That something happens in the periphery, like in the foot or the hand, and then there is a message that's telegraphed up through the spinal cord and into the brain to a pain processing area of the brain. It's just a kind of a stimulus and response. And that's what we thought for years. Yes, there is indeed something called the somatosensory cortex, or the area that really processes the physical uh, perception of pain. But what we since learned, predominantly bodies, gentlemen pictured here, Melzack and Wall, that pain is more than just a sensory experience. There's also emotional components, kind of an affective component. And there's also a cognitive component, kind of the cognitive value, value to component. And what we see in our neuroimaging, in our neuroscience, is that pain is processed by many more areas of the brain than just the somatosensory cortex alone. In this, um, in this illustration, we can see many of the most commonly observed pain areas of the brain, everything from the motor cortex to the singular cortex, which is actually involved in concentration and focusing, to the prefrontal cortex, which is typically involved in problem solving, the amygdala, which we always think about as being the emotional processing core of the brain, somatosensory cortex, where we really do discriminate where the, where the sensory stimuli are coming from, all the way to the stress response systems as they're, as they're processed through the hypo hypothalamus, and the hippocampus where memory is stored. So there's many, many structures, and these structures are all interconnected. When one activates, it's often communicating to other areas of the brain. And to help make my point, I'm going to present to you just kind of a series of studies that I find fascinating. They're kind of what I call a Whitman sampler of pain studies that help us kind of understand what an unusual process pain is. So I begin with this first study by Bex and colleagues. They observed, that brain, they observed the brain activations of subjects in response to the threat of a painful electrical shock. They then had the same subjects watch a friend or in a and a complete stranger gets threatened with that same painful shock. What they observed was that the friend, that would, I'm sorry, what they observed is when the friend was threatened, the exact same areas of the brain, the observer's brain, lit up. So the anterior insula, the putamen, and the supermarginal gyrus of the observer lit up in response to seeing their friend being threatened. But what was more striking was that when a total stranger was threatened with the same painful shock, the observer's brain did not have that same activation. It really took the closeness of the relationship to engender that same vicarious sense of pain. Well, what's interesting is humans aren't the only ones that do this. Mice do a similar type of vicarious pain response. In a study by Langford and colleagues, what they did is they had um, a mouse um, observe a friendly cage mate in a situation where the mouse was restrained and struggling and questionably in pain, unquestionably in pain. And what happened, the mouse who observed the, the friendly mouse in pain, that mouse became much more pain sensitive when it was tested for its sensitivity. But what was fascinating is when that same mouse watched a stranger mouse, a mouse it did not know, struggling and in pain, it did not show that same hypersensitivity, that same uh, pain reaction to the stranger mouse. So it has to be this relationship, this connectivity that inspires this vicarious pain. In another example, I think we've all thought about the athlete or the individual who doesn't even feel pain. Something bad happens, something very painful, and yet it's not until the end of the game that the person realizes that they're injured. And in this picture, this is uh, Devin Gardner. He's a University of Michigan quarterback from a few years ago. And he was playing in one of our most important games against that school from Ohio. And in this game, he has a broken foot and doesn't even realize the pain until the game is over. And here we see uh, studies by Terrence and also Frankenstein. I love that name, by the way. Um, other studies have shown this same phenomenon. 
And in a study that we are conducting right now, we just got our preliminary data. We are having women in their first stage of labor use virtual reality glasses to have an immersive experience, um, something lovely like, uh, like diving through the ocean or being by the beach. And what we found in these preliminary data is that the women experienced a 40%, up to a 40% decrease in pain just by being in the immersive virtual reality world. We also know from studies that cursing decreases the experience of pain. That if you curse loudly while having your hand submerged into a bucket of ice water, you actually report feeling less pain. But what they did find, though, is that there is a habituation effect. So if you curse too much, it stops working. And there are many, many studies that show that sadness is very closely tied to the experience of pain. And in this, in this Yoshino story, they, um, study, they showed that um, the neural activations of a sad person look really quite different than those of a, of a person who isn't depressed, who is experiencing pain. And in other studies, we have demonstrated that hearty laughter, real, what we call Duchenne laughter, that's laughter that comes from your belly actually results in increased pain thresholds. So you can actually take more pain when you're laughing. And that led the research to think that maybe there's like an endorphin-mediated effect. You know, when you have a runner's high and you release your endogenous opioids, they think that might be at work for, for intense laughter. And really fascinatingly, there is a study that looked at social rejection. And what they found is that social rejection looks very similar to pain in the brain. And in individuals who receive acetaminophen over a three-week period, they actually reported lower feelings of social rejection and sadness. So that's suggesting that a medication made for peripheral pain actually was changing the experience of, of um, emotional pain. So these studies tell us three very important things about the nature of pain. First, thoughts, emotions, and pain are all kind of neural events processed by many of the same areas of the brain. They also tell us that damage and tissue injury can be optional in the experience of pain. You don't have to have damage to have pain. And other time, pain and damage don't necessarily feel painful. And lastly, that psychological, emotional, and intentional processes are all intricately associated with the experience of pain. So pain really is much, much more than simple stimulus and response. So here is a quiz. Physicians love this one. If you look at these radiographs, and I think I probably have quite a few patients here, but I bet you could look at these two knees and guess which one might hurt, right? So the knee on the left, you see a fair amount of space between the, the, the two bones there in the joints. The one on the right, though, we see bone-on-bone bone osteoarthritis. What's fascinating, though, is in many studies, the bone-on-bone bone arthritis is not the knee that hurts. We can look at a sample of people that we just pull off the street, and about 40% of them will have damage in their knees or their elbows or their backs that look like it should hurt and don't, while the other people will talk about having very, very intense pain in their knees, backs, or joints, and not show these same types of uh, radiographic findings. So how can that be? So our group has done a, just a tremendous amount of work looking at difference in mechanisms in pain. And what we found is that there are some very distinct differences. The first mechanism we think about in character, characterizing pain is what we call peripheral. This is the pain is coming from the outside. Peripheral meaning it's no susceptible, meaning there's some sort of painful stimuli that's causing the pain. This is seen in inflammatory pain, as in rheumatoid arthritis, or mechanical damage in tissues, such as in osteoarthritis. This type of pain is very responsive to peripheral acting um, drugs like NSAIDs or opioids. It also re usually responds well to procedures like operations or epidural steroid injections, et cetera. The second type of pain is neuropathic pain. Now, neuropathic pain is predominantly due to damage or dysfunction of the peripheral nerves. It's like an impingement syndrome or a pin, like we hear about pinched back nerves. So this type of pain is responsive often to NSAIDs and opioids, a lot like the peripheral 
type of pain, but also response to centrally acting, you know, um, um, agents that act uh, to this in the central nervous system, like um, like TCAs and other neuroactive compounds. And types of uh, neuropathic pain include diabetic neuropathic uh, uh, diabetic neuro neuropathic pain as well as post hepatic neuralgia. And the third type of pain is a central pain, or what we call centralized pain. This is non-nociceptive, meaning that there isn't necessarily something that is causing some sort of tissue damage or impingement or inflammation that's actually causing the pain. It's more that this pain is caused by a central disturbance in the central nervous system and how pain is actually processed. So these patients experience hyperalgesia, which means more pain. To a, to a given stimuli. Um, this type of uh, pain is more responsive to neuroactive agents and that alter the um, neurotransmitters that are involved in pain processing in the central nervous system. Uh, t examples of centralized pain are fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome, tension headache. And what's interesting about these painful conditions, though, is that any combination of pain can be present in a given individual. We see very many people with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis who also have centralized pain, have comorbid fibromyalgia or centralized pain state. We see this commonly in neuropathic pain patients, too, that a lot of them will have kind of this secondary centralized pain. So there's a lot of overlap in these painful conditions. When we look at pain in the general population, it usually is along a bell-shaped curve. On the bottom axis, the y-axis, we have the degree of tenderness that ranges on the left from not very tender to very, very tender on the right side. And the amount of patients in the population will have this tenderness profile. And what we know is that people in general have a very unique volume control. And ours is, and every place is just slightly different. The volume control is really the degree to which your central nervous system amplifies the pain signal or the stimuli signal. We know that this volume control, how you, per, you know, how you perceive this pain is set by many factors, including genetic factors, neurohormonal factors, neuroplasticity, even environmental and social factors. And that the higher one's volume control setting is, the more pain one will experience, despite how much peripheral or um, external uh, stimuli there are. And we know that there are some folks on this far right-hand side of the curve who are particularly sensitive to pain. These folks who are particularly sensitive, sensitive pain, we, we think are the ones that are most prone to have kind of a centralized pain disorder, central nervous system mediated pain disorder. These individuals include those with fibromyalgia, with TMJ um, syndrome, with idiopathic low back pain, with vulvodynia, um, with irritable bowel syndrome. And who these patients are, or who is at risk for this, um, is becoming more understood. We refer to this as the pain-prone phenotype, the people who are at the highest risk. Now, you can have all these factors and not have chronic pain, but if you do have these factors, you are more likely to have one of these chronic pain conditions. Number one is being female. Early life trauma also increases your risk for one of these centralized pain conditions. Having a family or personal history of chronic pain, there seems to be a very strong genetic component. Um, having other centrally mediated systems, for example, having a lot of fatigue or poor sleep or having cognitive problems. Um, individuals who are just more hypoalgesic, who, who have more pain sensitivity or um, have uh, the, the descending, the, the part of the pain system that decreases the experience of pain, having that system not working as effectively. And then also one of the most powerful things and one of the things I'm interested in as a psychologist in particular is the presence of negative thoughts and high levels of negative emotions more broadly, like depression and anxiety. So these factors coupled with either very intense stressors or chronic stressors or even chronic stressors to the body, such as an illness or a persistent pain condition, can result in the manifestation of one of these one of these centralized pain syndromes, or even having one of these syndromes and having new pain occur. So what is the role of emotions? I think I already alluded to the importance of negative emotions, right? These include fear and anger, guilt, shame, loneliness, frustration. There's many of these negative emotions that result in a fair amount of, of um, activation. 
And what we see in studies, many, many studies have been conducted, conducted looking at the, the impact of negative emotions such as anxiety and depression um, and how they impact individuals with chronic pain. And, and it's really very clear that high levels of negative emotions are associated with higher um, ex higher pain intensity or, or greater report of pain, um, less tolerance to painful stimuli, being more pain sensitive, greater use of pain medications, um, having more physical symptoms and more fatigue, as well as having poorer quality of life, having more psychiatric comorbidity, sense of anxiety and depression, and even just not feeling very good about your ability to manage your pain. So negative emotions color all aspects of pain from function to the way that the pain feels. And this makes sense to us because it's quite clear that pain and emotion are processed by many of the same areas of the brain. And here's a nice example by a study by Shackman and colleagues noting that negative emotions, pain, and cognitive control are all commonly, um, or activate a common region, uh, the anterior mid cortex is in this, in this um, fMRI. And then, conversely, Positive emotions are what we refer to as positive affect. Affect is just kind of another word for emotions. So these include happiness, love, contentment, calm, enthusiasm, interest, empathy, determination, and many, many others. Just these just positive emotions. These activate the body in a different way. I mean, you can probably imagine what does what's going on in your body as you think about the worst things in your life, the things that make you the saddest. What does your stomach feel like? What are, what, are you, what are your muscles doing? As opposed to thinking about the things that bring you the greatest joy, what makes you happy, what inspires you, what makes you feel so proud and delighted. There's an entire different physiological concomitant with that. Alongside of positive emotions are also what we study commonly are resilience factors. So of course, positive affect or positive emotions are right at the top of that list. But, but resilience factors also include self-efficacy or the belief that you can take care of your business, your friends, yourself, your pain. Social support is extremely powerful in protecting against pain, as are just having a good sense of your psychological well-being, of feeling good and centered, having an internal locus of control, believing that you can affect your world and affect your pain, being more extroverted, which usually brings people in contact with you, hardiness or perseverance and grit. That has a lot to do with determination and, and willing to follow through, optimism, courage, benefit finding, these are all really, really powerful resilience factors that we really should try to harness. We try so hard all the time to diminish things like depression, and anxiety, and hopelessness, but we spend too little time trying to build these resilience factors. And you know what? Maybe they're more important than even negative emotions. So there is very good data that show that positive emotions are related to lower pain ratings, lower pain intensity scores, um, much decreased uh, pain the next day or, day or days after having very, very positive experiences. People with a lot of positive emotions use less medication. They have lower post-op pain ratings. Um, they tend to be walking sooner after surgery and um, can even be discharged from hospital sooner. So what underlies this magic? Why would positive emotions have anything to do with pain and with healing? What do positive emotions really do? So we looked at the theory of Barbara Fredrickson, who developed the broaden and build theory. And what she says is that experiences of positive emotions broaden your momentary thought action repertoire. They broaden what you think that you can even do. These Options in turn serve to build your personal resources, ranging from physical and intellectual resources to social and psychological resources. Okay, so think about it in terms of what negative emotions are meant to do from a survival standpoint. Negative emotions like fear and anxiety make you narrow your field of vision. They make you focus like a pinprick so that you can survive. You see the tiger in the weeds because you are focused right in the center, right in front of you. But broaden the, but, but positive emotions tend to broaden your worldview. They make you sit up straight. They make you open up your eyes. They make you look back and forth. It's quite remarkable how they can just open you up in almost a physical way. They open you up to more creative, flexible thought. 
positive emotions have also been shown to undo negative emotions. So if you have some negative emotions, which we all should not do, the positive emotions that you have also can help undo any negative effects. And then positive emotions very powerfully help you build resources for later. So you store them up almost like groceries for later, right? These resources can help you bounce back after something bad does happen. And positive emotions naturally draw people in toward you, which results in greater social support. The sad thing is that positive emotions tend to be diminished in individuals with chronic pain. So it's not just having high levels of depression and anxiety. We see changes in chronic pain. So let me walk you through this chart a little bit. You see in the bright green healthy individuals, and then there is a score, negative affect. 18 is a score for healthy individuals. You know, you want to have a low score here, high is bad. And then in the next column, you see positive affect. And you see in healthy individuals, they have a score around 35, because high is good. You want lots of positive affect. Okay, then you go to the next row and you see, or the next line, you see osteoarthritis. You see negative affect at 16, which is low, that's good. So osteoarthritis patients, they look like healthy adults as far as uh, negative affect. But then you go over to positive affect and they're at 31, they're a little lower. So, you know, maybe a little fewer good feelings than um, average healthy individuals. Then we look at lupus patients. Look at 22 for negative affect. That's high. That's much higher than healthy individuals and those with osteoarthritis. And then positive affect, though, they're pretty good positive affect-wise. Then we get to fibromyalgia and chronic low back pain. And what you see with both of these chronic pain states is very high levels of negative emotions and very low levels, dramatically low levels of positive affect. So what do we do? So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how people with chronic pain are not all the same, and maybe this will help you recognize you or where your patient might fit in this, in this continuum. So for our exercise, what we do here at the University of Michigan Outpatient Clinic is we collect data from all of our new patients that present for a regular visit with our, at our anesthesiology pain care. Center. And we had at this point of this analysis 4,700 patients to look at. And what we did is we did, conducted a, a, an analysis called cluster analysis that allows us to force people into groups. And so we can see there's differences between groups. And we assess patients on their pain scores and on their positive emotions and negative emotions, as well as the anxiety and depression, and also the degree to which folks think catastrophic catastrophizing thoughts about their pain, which catastrophizing thoughts or catastrophizing is, is a very, very strong correlate of all things bad in chronic pain. So what we did is we took these 4,716 individuals and put them into three groups and found that we had kind of an interesting group. It was not what we expected. We kind of thought everybody or a lot of folks would be in that right-hand column, kind of that distress column. But that certainly was not the case. What we found is that about the second highest group of patients were in this resilient group. These folks had a fair amount of pain, because there's pain scores across the top. You can see 5.5 was the average pain. And so that's a lot of pain. And then these resilient folks had pain but they had very low levels of depression and anxiety, were, had very little catastrophizing, had very low negative affect. Remember, 18 is where we saw the healthiest. They were lower than the healthy people that we saw previously, and very high levels of positive affect. They looked pretty much like healthier than healthy people as far as their emotional functioning. In the second group, we had what we kind of called struggling. These folks were doing OK, but they were having a harder time. These folks had a little bit more pain, were slightly more prone to have not full-scale depression, but certainly kind of more depressed mood and were feeling slightly more anxious. They were more prone towards catastrophizing, but they had higher levels of negative affect and low levels of positive emotions. Okay. Then you look at our third column. These folks were in much worse shape. They, were, they, they had very higher levels of pain, were much more likely to actually be depressed and have high levels of anxiety. Um, we're catastrophizing at levels that were what we would consider off the chart, and their negative affect also kind of off the chart, positive affect, so incredibly low. These individuals would need our, our most intensive care. But again, these are three very, very different subsets of individuals. 
what we found when we did additional analysis is that uh, the resilient group just demonstrated the best functioning overall. They had less, of course, obviously less pain, but they were certainly just did the best in the world overall. And um, one of the things that we did find just kind of coincidentally that you know, goes along with our pain-prone phenotype is that history of abuse uh, was really quite different amongst the groups with the distressed group and the struggling group having much higher rates. So that's kind of one way to think about patients, right? That there's just kind of three gradients of the kind of the severity and their emotional functioning. Another way that I think we've done quite a bit of work in is, um, is what we call affective balance or emotional balance. And I want you to think about this in terms of how you function in the world, okay? So any person at any time has both positive emotions and negative emotions on board. So some people have high levels of negative emotion and high and low levels of positive emotion. We kind of think of these folks as a little bit on the depressive side. Okay? There's other folks that have high levels of negative um, affect, but also high levels of positive affect. These folks are pretty, what we call reactive. They're, they're full of a lot of emotion. You probably know people like this. They're kind of up then, then they're kind of angry, but they're, you know, they're wonderfully passionate. Right? These are our reactive kinds of folks. Then there's other folks that have low levels of negative emotions and high levels of positive emotions. Again, these are kind of these healthy folks that we've been kind of talking about. And then lastly, there's folks that are just plain mellow. They're what we call our low folks. They have low levels of positive emotions and low levels of negative emotions. They're kind of just mellow. All right, so we've actually done some real science here. And we've looked at this in fibromyalgia. And we found that when we look at affective balance in fibromyalgia, very few of our fibromyalgia patients had a healthy affective balance. Okay, more than not, they were depressive with a low positive affect and high negative affect. And what this showed us is that um, if you have this more reactive and depressive styles where you have lots of positive affect on board, these patients were more likely to have greater pain and worse functioning. And then those uh, with depressive and reactive styles were actually more likely to have depression and anxiety, which makes sense because in both of these um, affective styles, we see lots of negative affect. We also worked with the folks at Mayo Clinic and looked at 735 of their patients in their fibromyalgia registry. And we found that a, a similar thing, about 12% of their patients, their fibromyalgia patient, had a healthy affective balance style. And they too also showed many, many more patients with that depressive style. And what we saw is that compared to having a healthy style, all other styles were associated with worse pain, fatigue, cognitive problems sleep problems, depression. So it really is important to have this more healthy affective style. And then in a recent study we just published last year, we looked at patients with chronic low back pain uh, to look at their affective style. Would they look similar to our patients with fibromyalgia? And what we saw is that 81% of our low back pain patients had very low levels of positive emotions. And um, that was actually, our patients were more likely to have low positive emotions than high negative emotions. And here too, we had only 12% of our patients have a healthy affective style. And those with a depressive style were more likely to have greater pain and worse functioning. But what we did notice is that patients with a reactive style, that's the style that has high levels of positive emotions and high levels of negative emotions, they actually did a little bit better. They, they looked more like the healthy patients. It's like that positive affect, those positive emotions were balanced balancing out the negative emotions. So when we look at all three of those affect balance studies, they suggest that affect imbalance is really important in chronic pain because it not only is just about negative affect that drives the effects like more pain and worse functioning, but it's really kind of the relative levels of positive and negative emotions. We also can look at these studies and say, you know what, chronic pain patients are not all the same. And then lastly, I think positive emotions are a very worthy target for intervention in people with chronic pain, and many others are starting to come to this as well. So how can we help you and your patients enhance positive emotions? So I think the first principle is that individuals with chronic pain tend to give up the very things that can bring joy to their lives. They're in a survival mode. They will take care of the kids, of the job, of the chores, of the bills, everything that has 
the energy that they have to do first. What are the survival functions? Those get done first. And by doing that, the joy in life gets lost, and negative emotions get increased, and positive emotions diminish. Our patients tend to think, one day when I get better, I'll do this thing I love to do. But you know what? Perhaps today should be the day because it's good for health. So cognitive behavioral therapy has an intervention called positive activity scheduling. And this is very similar to this, um, this uh, intervention, which we call savoring a beautiful day. And what you do for this is you set aside a block of time that you, to do the things that you love to do. Now, maybe you can do this every day for a few minutes, or maybe you do it once a week for an hour or two. But ideally, the first time you try this, set aside a couple of hours, okay? Block that time out, put it on your calendar. Do not let anything interfere with it. Treat it like a doctor's appointment or something that's absolutely the most critical thing in the world. Then you plan the activities you love or a series of events that you love, things that bring you real pleasure, and carry them out as you plan on your schedule. Schedule that beautiful day. And more importantly, when you're in the middle of engaging in this fun activity, savor these activities. Use all of your senses. Use feelings of gratitude to say, oh, I am here. I'm in this moment. This is great. And tap into your optimism as you're doing this thing you love. Savoring refers to our awareness of pleasure, being aware, savoring that piece of chocolate or that coffee or that hug of your best friend. It's the deliberate attempt to make this moment last. So consider taking a mental snapshot of the moments that you are enjoying. Know what you're feeling, seeing, hearing, smelling, thinking in that moment. Be very, very mindful of that beautiful moment and say, remember this moment like a camera. People who savor are happier, more satisfied with life in general, are more optimistic and less depressed. Savoring is a mindful act. Okay, another intervention would be great to try. And again, I'm talking to my providers here too. Do these for yourself. Take care of yourselves and pass these on your patients. So keeping a gratitude diary, probably the thing I love doing almost more than anything. One of the ways you can keep a gratitude diary, again, there's no right or wrong ways, but every day write down three things for which you're grateful. It can be anything. The feeling of the sunshine in your face, happy that a friend gave you a phone call, a kiss from your puppy, a gift that somebody gave you, um, anything. Okay. What kind of time to do this? Most people like to do this at the end of the day because you can kind of reflect. Okay, Write down this thing. Make a commitment that you will write down these three things every day. But here is the rub. Every day the three things must be different. Never repeat things. So what you'll find is that in the first week you'll probably write down, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my job. I'm grateful for my sister. By the second week, you are really looking for things to write down in that day. So you'll be looking, oh, 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 I really love that flower. I'm going to write about that flower. So it opens you up to looking for great things during the day. Okay? So when you write these things down, feel, these things down at the end of the day, feel free to get detailed. But you know, just you can just write the three things down. Okay? When you feel down, maybe go back and reread these. Another thing that, um, another intervention that's shown to enhance uh, resilience is intentional kindness. So every day we do things and fail to recognize the kind things that we do. This is about being mindful about kindness, being intentional and mindful. So in this exercise, for one week, do an intentionally kind thing for either a loved one, a complete stranger, or yourself. You can pick each day. All righty. When you do these kind things for strangers, look the person in the eye, but expect nothing in return. You're doing something that is kind. You can do things that are anonymous, too. If somebody is grateful, take in the gratitude. Say, oh, OK. <laughs> Don't deny that the person is grateful. When you do the kind thing for yourself, acknowledge the importance of self-care and kindness. This is something I, I see in, in chronic pain patients is they don't engage in self-care. They're kind to everybody else but themselves. So take the, kind, the time to be kind to yourself. Because if you are kind to yourself and you are um, engaging in self-care, there's going to be more of you and a better you to help care for others. So log these things in a journal every day for seven days. Note what the act of kindness was and how doing it made you feel. 
Okay, do this for seven days. Give it a try. And these are just photographs of, of my students. I, I teach a, a freshman class and where I teach a freshman how to how to do these things and they're they're out spreading acts of kindness. We have the world's friendly squirrels at the University of Michigan. You can actually touch them. All righty, another um, evidence-based intervention is called Three Good Things. What you do here is every night for the next week, right before you go to bed, write down three things that went particularly well on that day. These things can be ordinary and small in nature or really big things. Next to that thing you've written down, write down, why did that happen? See if you can figure out what were the elements that brought that to fruition. Again, with these interventions, do them one at a time. You don't have to do these all at once, but pick those ones that feel fun and right to you, and you can do them in succession. Now, here's an intervention that we are in the process of studying in three different cohorts. We're studying it in healthy adults, in patients with chronic pain who are undergoing an epidural steroid injection, and we're studying it in women with breast cancer who are preparing for surgery. So what is the positive piggy bank? Well, the way that this works is we give the patient a piggy bank and a bunch of little paper slips, usually about 30 of them, because we usually do this 30 days before surgery or 30 days after the intervention. And they also get a little plastic card. And on the plastic card, it says, every evening think about the people, things, or events that made you happy that day. You may make a list if you like. Pick one of these and spend a moment savoring it. What made it so special to you? Now write down this moment on a currency slip, so the little pieces of paper we give them. Use enough detail that you can immediately recall what happened later. Next, add the date, fold up your happy memory currency, and drop it into your piggy bank. You will make these happy memory deposits in the same way every evening for the next 30 days. Then, to give you an example, in the case of surgery, the night before surgery, we call them and we tell the patient, um, close your account. This means that you withdraw all the currency from your piggy bank and read each and every one of the deposit of happy memory slips. As you read them, try to recall the details of the happy event and what made it so special to you at the time. Enjoy. So with the, some initial data I can show you, uh, this is in our healthy population when we were at 89 patients. Uh, what these are these are individuals that have very like almost no depression, very very low levels. We wanted to look at very healthy people, and what we found is that in a very psychologically healthy sample, we saw we still saw great improvement in life satisfaction, and that if people had any depressive or negative symptoms at all, it looked like it the uh, the ver the reaction was much more profound. And here's just kind of the example of how we saw satisfaction scores change. The blue are the people who were in the positive piggy bank, and the red are the people who were in the control condition. So do try the positive piggy. You can, you, the positive piggy bank can be done with a spouse or a friend. Or it can be done, I've seen families do it together at the dinner table. So it's just kind of a neat way to help you re reflect over the events of the day. So as we wind down, a few other interventions that can help resilient, uh, enhance resilience are physical activity. There are endless studies that tell us that exercise and physical activity can help individuals with chronic pain. And I think so. We get stuck on the need to have to start a formal regimen of going to the gym or hiring a trainer or jogging or some such thing. And that's not so. Physical activity such as regular walking, gardening, housework, playing with your kids or pets, dancing, just moving can be really, really helpful which leads me to probably the coolest dancing study I've ever seen. So there was a study that was conducted um, to look at uh, the effects of people dancing together in synchrony, as if they were doing a routine, and also the level of exertion. And what they found is that when people dance together and at high levels of exertion, these folks experience less pain. And actually, it's kind of funny. It was actually Gangnam Style that had, the, when they danced to, to that, that had the, the highest effect. What they found is that individuals um, had the greatest change in pain threshold when they danced together and when, with high exertion. So that tells me, go out there and have fun. So as we toil away and how we can bring these things to you, we're working very hard here at the University of Michigan to make 
all these interventions available because web-based platforms really do open up all these interventions to the world. We currently have Fiber Guide free and available at the um, at the link there below at the um, web address down below. Fiber Guide is a cognitive behavioral intervention that people can do on their own. It's self-management. One of the modules is Time for You. That's when, that's that kind of that positive activity scheduling. So we do integrate positive. Um, uh, interventions there, but this is something that you can paste through it. It can be customized for, for you. It's a wonderful intervention, and you don't have to have fibromyalgia to use it. Any chronic pain state can benefit from for most of these modules, from sleep to, to relaxation to helping you think differently. If you want a more frankly um, positive activity intervention, I recently collaborated with the folks at Happify to develop a track there to, that's entitled Love Your Life Despite Chronic Pain that, that integrates many of these positive activities um, online. And, and last I checked, this, uh, this was available at no cost. So I do want to close with a one more study. I, I gave you a bunch of studies at the beginning of my talk. This final study is about love. And what was done in this study, this was conducted also at the University of Michigan. And what they did is they advertised for individuals within the Ann Arbor community who were desperately in love. And they brought these des desperately loved people into the laboratory and used various um, questionnaires to make sure that they were as in the love as they want, as they said they were. And they, and they took the, the most desperate of desperate in love people. And they put them in a scanner to look at their brain activation. And what they did is they tested them with a painful stimulus that was applied to the forearm. And what they identified is that when they showed the person in love, a picture of the beloved when they were in the scanner and getting the painful stimuli, the pain was much, much less and, and, and processed by the brain as being much less painful. So again, joy, dancing, and love are all good for chronic pain. So just to close with my acknowledgments, I nothing happens in a vacuum. I can't do anything without my wonderful my wonderful director of our center, Daniel Claw, and all of the other co-investigators at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, as well as our statisticians and our research assistants that really do the hard work, and of course our outstanding funding agencies. So with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Afton, for the great um, presentation and some really helpful tools that people can use, I think, <clears throat> um, for building that, that kind of resilience. Um, let's see. I invite everybody who is online to go ahead and type in your questions into the question box. Um, we do have one waiting here. Um, someone asking, what is your advice for someone who deals with anxiety, depression, ADHD, and chronic pain? And wondering when they're dealing with it, um, and they have dealt with it for a long time, um, it, it's hard to know, is the depression and anxiety causing the pain, or is the pain causing the depression and anxiety, and kind of how do you deal with with that my, those kinds of comorbidities? I love that question. That is great, because I think, I would think most chronic pain patients would, would concur that most don't just deal with chronic pain alone. It rarely seems to occur in a vacuum, and it is hard to know what is causing what. So kind of my answer is yes. <laughs> the depression and anxiety are contributing to the chronic pain. The chronic pain is contributing to the depression and anxiety. The ADHD probably put on top kind of makes everything worse. So certainly, as a psychologist, I always say you, need, you, you don't just dwell on the happy stuff. You do need to address the depression and the anxiety, and getting good care is the first thing. So whether it be therapeutic care, in some cases uh, the, the, the need for, uh, for, um, for pharmacological care is helpful. But my suggestion is no matter what other things you're doing, you can weave some of these, inter these positive interventions into your life that there is nothing that uh, we've, we've yet to find anything that's harmful with any of these interventions. And all they tend to do is start to build positive emotions. So I think as I try to illustrate with our brain um, studies, the series, is all of these areas of the brain talk to each other. And they're all closely and communicated, and many of them overlap. So if you're feeding positivity, 
good things in, exercise, activity, friends, social elements, you can start to affect the depression and anxiety and the chronic pain, at least the, the neural aspects as well as the behavioral. Often getting moving is one of the most important things that we do, getting engaged. So there is no magic bullet to knock out the chronic pain that's going to knock out the depression and the anxiety. Most of these things kind of ebb and flow together. And the best that you can do is treat them all, but also try and integrate some of these other interventions so that you can have a better quality of life. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Someone asking if you can elaborate a little more on early childhood trauma and chronic pain. Oh, again, an excellent question. And, and uh, um, an area that has really been quite well studied. Um, we do know that the nervous system is developing at an exponentially accelerated rate in childhood. And when bad things happen that create trauma and intensity, there are actually neural changes that co-occur. Okay, so again, we've, we're changing how the brain is processing. We're changing the connectivity. And individuals who have had trauma tend to um, have a lot of anxiety, tend to have depression, and that also seems to set people up for, for um, developing chronic pain. So we do know even in animal models where we're allowed to do things like separate animals or, or do traumatizing things to them, that mouse pups who are separated from their dams at an early age um, become much more pain sensitive. They are, you know, we, when we, we t tap them with a pain probe, they're just more sensitive. They've had this emotion, emotional trauma that has changed the way that they actually, actually process pain. So again, we don't know everything. We know that, the, that these commonly co-occur. But also, not everybody had traumatic childhood um, who, who have chronic pain. So we, we can't say it's you know, definitive. And many people who have had trauma in childhood do not develop chronic pain or even depression. There's a lot of variability. All right, great. Um, someone asking if you have data for some of these uh, interventions uh, that continue past six months or one year. Oh, that's a very good question. So we are actually doing that work right now. We are on pins and needles waiting um, on the final, final word on an NIH grant that will be one full year of trying four of these interventions in a chronic pain cohort. So that is a weakness. And what we do know is that uh, the effects of these, uh, of these interventions do tend to dissipate over time, just about like any other intervention. It, it's, it's kind of the need to practice some of these, to, to adopt some of these. So if gratitude seems to be your thing, to make that kind of a lifelong thing. I think it's a lot like meditation or any of the other uh, interventions that um, you can't just kind of do something once and hope that, you know, think about exercise. You know, you can't, you can't just exercise hard one day and hope that you'll have long-term um, effects forever. But we will, uh, we will test this notion with a uh, randomized controlled trial that, like I said, that has a year um, follow-up period. Great. Um, someone asking about the affect balance style and fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia study and wondering was the affect determined prior to their diagnosis or after and are there any studies regarding this? Like would someone with a negative affect be more likely to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia and chronic pain? Yeah, yeah. you know, so we, so we actually conducted this study in patients who were already diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So these were individuals that we were seeing in our clinic. And so it's difficult to know what their affective state was like before. Um, I'm trying to think of longitudinal studies. Yes, I'm drawing a blank on anybody who has frankly looked at positive affect and healthies. So probably the closest thing is the OPERA study conducted at the University of North Carolina by Bill Maxner and his team. And what they did is they looked at individuals, women, who um, did not have TMJ, um, um, temporal mandibular joint disorder, and followed them over time. And they did a very, very deep phenotype, and they looked at positive affect and negative affect. And I'm 
mostly sure that both positive affect and negative affect were predictive of those who um, who did develop uh, TMJ down the road. And I got to look that up. But there's not been a lot because there's been very little research that's looked at a large cohort of individuals before, you know, because it's very expensive to do that because you're only going to probably have about three to five percent of your cohort manifest the illness. And then is that enough people to be able to um, predict outcomes? But love the question though. It's very smart. Is it trait or state, I think, is what the question is about the affect. Wonderful. Um, uh, two different people asking about two different strong emotional reactions to chronic pain that they have um, clients who have. So one asking about how to address anger, people who are very angry over the pain, and another person asking a question about someone who's fixated on finding a cure. Oh, boy. Okay. Let's see. Which one do we do first? Let, let's do anger. So anger is a really normal reaction to um, not getting what you think you need to survive and be okay. All right, anger is often driven by anxiety. And if you get down to what's usually going on with the angry pe person, they're usually afraid. And if you can normalize the anger and tell them you have every right to be angry and allow them to vent and legitimize and see the next level. Are they afraid of something? And sometimes you can uncover what is, you know, the fear that I'm going to lose my employment, or I'm going to lose my house, or you know, there's some other thing, and that is what's driving the anger. And the second question? Yes, it was people who are fixated on finding a cure for the chronic pain. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, uh, this is going to sound so snarky, but wouldn't you be? If I had chronic pain, I would want a cure. Oh, so I, I think that's a normal and healthy reaction to living with an impossible situation. But I think what you do is you tell them just that. If I were you, I'd be looking for a cure too. We don't have one. What we do have and what we are good at now is management. But I'm going to need you to help me with management. And I wish I had the magic bullet. I wish I had the cure. But let's get you back to doing the things, some of the things that you love doing. Let's get you living your life. Because you can either fret over all or nothing living. I will live my life and enjoy my life once I have a cure. Or live your life as it is right now and see if you can work towards um, at least better functioning. Great. Um, someone asking, seeing how in the brain pain and emotions interact, has there been any studies on how neurofeedback can be beneficial? You know, there, there has been a number of neurofeedback studies, but unfortunately that is a little bit out of my realm of expertise, so I'm not able to kind of cite a bunch of them off my head, but yes, there are studies have been done in that area. Okay, great. And I would also say for the person who asked that question, we do have some webinars with a few specialists who deal specifically with the brain and chronic pain and like brain scans and other neurological uh, aspects of chronic pain. So uh, you can refer some of those as well. Um, all right. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up because we are pretty close to time. Um, thank you very much, Afton, for the presentation and for your insight and knowledge. Uh, it sounds like you guys are doing really exciting work there at the uh, University of Michigan, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else you have that comes out. Well, great. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you, everybody who listened in on this call. Um, I am happy to answer questions, too. I can be reached at afton at umich.edu. Um, and again, uh, thanks for your attention.